You want to take photographs? All right. Finish? Good, thank you. Mr. President, Excellencies, Honourable Ministers, Ambassadors, Distinguished Delegates, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen, Public health constantly struggles to hold infectious diseases at bay, to change lifestyle behaviours, and to find enough money to do these and many other things. But sometimes we need to step back. We need to step back and celebrate. Commitment to the Millennium Development Goals brought focus, energy, creative innovation, and above all, money to bear on some of the biggest health challenges that mar the start of this century. We can celebrate the 19,000 fewer children dying every day, the 44% drop in maternal mortality, and the 85% of tuberculosis cases that are successfully cured. Africa, in particular, can celebrate the 60% decline in malaria mortality, especially since ELMA, the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, supported by partners, did so much to make this happen. We can celebrate the fastest scaling up of a life-saving treatment in history. Let me remind you, more than 15 million people living with HIV are now receiving antiretroviral therapy, up from just about 690,000 in the year 2000. That's quite an achievement. A culture of measurement and accountability evolved also during the MDG era to make A more effective. Greater transparency brought the voice of civil society to bear in holding governments and in holding donors accountable for their promises. The health profile has also changed. The way people look at health now is different. It has moved from looking at health as a drain on resources to an investment, to an investment that builds stable, prosperous and equitable societies. Everyone in this room can be proud of these achievements. You have saved many millions of lives. Your strategic and technical innovations have left us well prepared to set our sight even higher. You, honourable ministers and partners, you deserve an applause. Ladies and gentlemen, in an interconnected world, characterised by profound mobility of people and goods, very few threats to health are local anymore. Air pollution is a transboundary hazard that affects the global atmosphere and contributes to climate change. Drug resistance pathogens, including the growing number of superbugs, travel well internationally in people, animals and food. The marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages, especially to children, is now a global phenomenon. Safeguarding the quality of pharmaceutical products has become much harder, much harder and much more complex because the manufacturing procedures and the supply chains span across multiple countries and multiple companies. Ensuring the quality of food, food supply, also safe food supply, is much harder now. Can you imagine what you ate this morning for lunch? A single meal nowadays can contain ingredients from all around the world, including some potentially contaminated with exotic pathogens. The refugee crisis in Europe taught the world that 
armed conflicts in faraway places will not stay remote. The Ebola outbreak in three small countries paralyzed the world with fear and travel constraints. Last year, a business traveler returning home to the Republic of Korea, infected with MERS coronavirus, disrupted the country's economy as well as its health system. The rapidly evolving outbreak of Zika, Zika virus warns us that an old disease that slumber for six decades in Africa and Asia can suddenly wake up, wake up on a new continent to cause a global health emergency. This year's appearance of urban yellow fever in Africa, now confirmed in the capital cities of Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo, is yet another serious event with potential for further international spread. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, for infectious diseases, you cannot trust the past when planning for the future. Changes in the way humanity inhabits the planet have given the volatile microbial world multiple new opportunities to exploit. There will always be surprises. The possibility that a mosquito bite during pregnancy could be linked to severe brain abnormalities in newborns alarmed the public and astonished scientists. Confirmation of a causal link between infection and microcephaly has transformed the profile of Zika from a mild disease to a devastating diagnosis for pregnant women and a significant threat to global health. Outbreaks that become emergencies always reveal specific weaknesses in affected countries and illuminate the fault lines in our collective preparedness. For Ebola, it was the absence of even the most basic infrastructures and capacities for surveillance, diagnosis, infection control and clinical care, unaided by any vaccines or specific treatments. For Zika, we are again taken by surprise with no vaccines and no reliable and widely available diagnostic tests. To protect women from child, of childbearing age, what can we do? We can only offer advice. Avoid mosquito bites, delay pregnancy, do not travel to areas with ongoing transmission. Seeker shows an extreme consequence of the failure to provide universal access to sexual health and family planning services. Latin America and the Caribbean have the highest proportion of unintended pregnancies anywhere in the world. Above all, the spread of Zika, the resurgence of dengue, and the emerging threat of chikungunya are the price being paid. The price being paid for a massive policy failure that dropped the ball on mosquito control in the 1970s. The lesson from yellow fever is especially brutal. The world failed to use an ex excellent tool, a preventive tool to its full strategic advantage. For more than a decade, WHO has been warning. We have been warning the world that changes in demography and changes in land use patterns in Africa have created ideal conditions for explosive outbreaks of urban yellow fever. Africa's, Africa's urbanization has been rapid and rampant, showing the fastest growth rate anywhere in the world. Migrants from rural areas and workers from mining and construction sites can now carry the virus into urban areas with powder cake conditions. Dense populations of non-immune people, heavy infestations with mosquitoes, exquisitely adapted to urban life, and the flimsy infrastructures that make mosquito control nearly impossible. The world has had a safe, 
low-cost and effective vaccine that confers lifelong protection against yellow fever since 1937. Let me emphasize, we have an effective vaccine that is cost-effective and affordable since 1937. So that is, let's count, 80 years ago. The yellow fever vaccine should be and must be used more widely to protect people living in endemic countries because yellow fever is not a mild disease. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, let me give you a stern warning. What we are seeing now looks more and more like a dramatic resurgence of the threat from the emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. The world is not prepared to cope. High-level assessments of the Ebola response have consistently called for more resilient health systems as a first line of defence. And this is also the position taken at the G7 summit being held later this week in Japan. I welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the current joint external evaluations that are looking at preparedness and response capacities in several countries. The evaluations need to continue with the utmost urgency as a tool under WHO authority and WHO coordination. WHO is the organization with universal legitimacy to implement international health regulation brackets 2005. The evaluations must be accompanied by well-resourced efforts to fill the gaps. We have many generous countries who promise to support 76 countries of the world to build the IHR core capacity. Failing to keep that promise is not good. So I urge all of you, keep your promises. Given what we face right now and the next surprises that are sure to come, the item on your agenda with the most sweeping consequences for a danger that can quickly sweep around the world is the one on the reform of WHO's work in health emergency management. The Secretariat's report gives you an overview of the design, oversight, implementation plan, and financing requirements of the new health emergencies program. Setting this up marks a fundamental change for WHO in which our traditional technical and normative functions are augmented by operational capacities needed to respond to outbreaks and humanitarian emergencies. Implementation of this change has moved forward quickly. The programs designed is aligned with the principles of a single program, with one line of clear line of authority, one workforce, one budget, one set of rules and processes, and one set of standard performance metrics. In March, I established an independent oversight and advisory committee. The eight members committee is monitoring the development and performance of the program. The committee will report its findings through the executive board to the World Health Assembly. I urge you, honorable ministers, I urge you to give this item the serious con consideration it deserves. Anything, anything short of full political and financial support for the program will handicap the WHO response right now and into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, very few health threats are local anymore. And few health threats can be managed by the health sector acting alone. As the international community enters the era of sustainable development, the global health landscape is being shaped by three slow motion disasters. A changing climate, the failure of more and more mainstay antibiotics, antimicrobials, 
and the rise of chronic non-communicable diseases as the leading killers worldwide. These are not natural disasters. They are man-made disasters created by policies that put economic interests above concerns about the well-being of human lives and the planet that sustains them. This is the way the world works. The burning of fossil fuel powers economies. Medicines for treating chronic conditions are more profitable, more profitable than a short course of antibiotics. That's why there's no investment. Highly processed foods that are cheap, convenient, and tasty gain a bigger market share than fresh fruits and vegetables. Unchecked, these slow motion disasters will eventually reach a tipping point where the harm done is irreversible. This is best documented by the two degrees centigrade limit for catastrophic climate change. For antimicrobial resistance, we are on the verge of a post-antibiotic era in which common infections, once again, will kill. If you want to know the future consequences of markets saturated with unhealthy foods and beverages, read the report of the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Devo Development wants to make sure these and many other disasters are averted. The agenda aims to do nothing less than transform the world and also the international systems that govern it work. The goals and targets are broad, visionary, and supremely ambitious. They have been criticized, by the way, by some as utopian, unaffordable, out of reach, and out of touch. I disagree. The vision inspires optimism and hope, but it is also firmly anchored in the realities of a world that desperately needs to change. The ambition of the agenda is to tackle the root causes of the world's many wolves, from the degrading misery to poverty to the consequences of terrorism and violence in an integrated and inclusive way. The agenda puts the people left behind first. We know what this implies. R&D market failures punish the poor, user fees punish the poor, and user fees discourage people from seeking care until the condition is severe and far more difficult and costly to manage. Diabetes is a prime example. User fees waste resources as well as human lives. The agenda, indeed, of the SDG is broad. And so are the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. The advantage of addressing these broad determinants is well reflected in the operational framework for implementing the global strategy for women's, children's, and adolescents' health. health holds a prominent and central place that benefits the entire agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, in the final analysis, the ultimate objective of all development activities, whether concerning the design of urban environments or the provision of modern energy to rural areas, is to sustain human lives in good health. In an interactive agenda, the broad determinants of health, coupled with methodologies that let us track progress with confidence, make investments in health a reliable marker of overall progress. Member States have approved roadmaps of strategic actions for taking forward work on individual health targets. Nearly all these strategies and plans map out priority R&D innovations that will boost the prospect of reaching ambitious goals. We all know innovations help. 
but innovations alone would not do it. Ambitious goals are feasible and affordable only if we cut out waste and inefficiency. We do so through integrated people-centered care that spans a whole life course from preconception through aging and brings prevention to the fore. The target for universal health coverage moves us in that direction, the right direction. UXC is a target that underpins all others. It is the ultimate expression of fairness that leaves nobody behind. It also has the best chance of meeting people's expectation. People's expectations for comprehensive care that does not drive them below the poverty line. And we have other resources to tap. The Woman Delivery Conference held last week in Copenhagen provides evidence of the energy unleashed when women, women are free from constraints of violence, discrimination, and unintended pregnancies. It also falls to the health sector to show some principal ethical backbone in a world, I'm afraid to say, for all practical appearances. We live in a world that has lost its moral compass. We must express outrage, outrage at the recent bombings of hospitals and refugee camps in Syria and Yemen, the use of rape and starvation as weapons of war, and the killing of innocent civilians in the pursuit of terrorist goals. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate not only the wealth of achievements and lessons learned during the MDG's era. I want to pay tribute to so many of you in this room, ministers, partners, and others, for all the achievements during the MDG era. But also, if we need to celebrate every victory that permanently eliminates a health threat Earlier this month, WHO declared that India, India has eliminated yours from its vast population. Last year, human cases of sleeping sickness reached the lowest level seen since data collection began 75 years ago. This year, only two cases of Guinea worm disease have been detected, both in Chad. After Cuba was validated as the first country in the world to eliminate mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis, a second wave of countries will be considered by the Global Validation Committee this week. Polio eradication has never seen so close to the finish line, with Africa now free of wild polio virus for nearly two years. During the short span of two weeks in April, 155 countries successfully switched from trivalent to bivalent oral polio vaccine, making the largest coordinated vaccine withdrawal in history. I want to thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you and your teams for this marvelous feat. What you and your team have done at the country level is giving us another milestone, milestone towards a world permanently void of a crippling disease. We have victories on other fronts as well. Many countries are exercising their legal right to mandate plain packaging for tobacco products, with the UK being the latest on the list of countries. Keep up with the good work. Why? These are critical victories. No country, no country can hope to bring down the burden of non-communicable diseases in the absence of a strong legislation for tobacco control. 
in line with the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. I commend so many countries who took the leadership and really move ahead of the curve and introduce plain packaging. I heard that the last victory in UK court, the big giant, you know what I'm referring to, the tobacco giant, decided not to appeal. This is a second victory after Australia. I think it's about time they stop appealing and harassing all the countries. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think world leaders are fully aware of the major challenges affecting the health in general and this organization in particular. Many recent meetings have focused on the crisis caused by antimicrobial resistance. I thank many of you, member states, too many to mention. I shall not do that. I thank Member States for taking this crisis so seriously, including the pressing need for incentives to get new products into the pipeline. World leaders are also concerned about the world drug problem and the need to broaden the balance, you know, make sure that the response take into consideration the important public health approach. They are concerned about a humanitarian system that is overwhelmed, overwhelmed and badly needs reform. As we are speaking, there is a very important meeting in Istanbul on World Humanitarian Summit, and that is the platform where the UN agency, along with partners, to address your concerns, we commit ourselves to change, to support you, to deliver on your expectations. And of course, there are other concerns as well. The world leaders are concerned about the cost to their economies as well as to health incurred by non-communicable diseases. Thanks to last year's successful event in Paris, now the world has a climate treaty. I thank Member States for recognizing the critical importance of strengthening health systems and embracing the vision of universal health coverage. Do you know how many resolutions you have approved to get us to this stage? Thank you for your hard work. We are well poised to implement the SDG. And you are, I also need to thank you in advance. This is in advance. We are also on the verge of delivering a solid framework for engagement with non-state actors that will mainstream a major area of reform. Keep up with the good work, Argentina. Get all the others on board. And this World Health Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, with this record-breaking number of agenda items, 76 in total, and participants, 3,500, tells me how much you expect from the big show. We have entered an ambitious new era for health development. We have a solid foundation of success to build on. The big show, together with its multiple partners, is poised to save many more millions of lives. I ask you, honorable ministers and delegates, I ask you to remember this purpose as we go through an agenda that can mean so much for the future. Thank you.